they just, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think they were ready. I, I don't think they knew what they wanted to do anymore with me. Mm. You know, it was kind of like, um, you know, you get to that point. It's like, okay, what am I going to do now on that stuff? You know? Um, and it was just kind of a mutual thing at the time. Okay. Yeah. I was I was wondering if your size was a factor because it seemed like everyone from we'll call it the golden era of wrestling leading into 1992 disappeared. Everybody disappeared, and and it felt like if you had muscles, they didn't want you around. And it well, it was because of the steroid thing that came up and all that stuff. That's what it came down to. Right. That's basically what a lot of it was right there. A lot of it. So at the time, the steroid trial clearly affected your business because, again, you were making WWF money, and suddenly they're like, hey, by the way, uh, we don't want you on anymore because of steroid reasons. And we're not saying you're taking steroids, but that you look like you might be, so we don't want that to be a perception of, hey, this guy's taking steroids, and he's on our show still. Like, everyone got small. Everyone got small. Yep, that's exactly what it was at the time. Yep. So even in, in July 2016, you did join a class auction lawsuit against the WWF um, over wrestlers being you know, injured, brain injuries during their tenure there. Why did you join this? Because I, I've talked to Ken Patera. I've talked to many people about this situation of why they joined. But why did you join this class action lawsuit? Mostly just because I've had a lot of, a lot of bad, bad problems with headaches and that stuff. Um, you know, the memory is not the same anymore as it was. Um, you know, just issues like that and that stuff, you know, that it, it slows you down. It's just kind of, uh, it makes you mag. It's just kind of embarrassing sometimes, you know, cause you're just of what you've done in your life and that stuff. And then all of a sudden something like this, it's hard, you know, and there, there could have been precautions like the precautions they have today. They got so many precautions in place now and that stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, back then we didn't have nothing and we just kept going. If you had to, if you got a concussion, you just kept going. There was no break. There was no nothing because we didn't have contracts back then. We were paid nightly. So if you didn't work, you weren't paid. You know, so we had to do what we had to do to try to keep going and that stuff. It was very tough. Now, I wonder if the situation was, was a little different because in today's world, say you have a, a drug issue, it doesn't matter if you work there or still or you did work there. They send you to rehab. They get you pay for that stuff. The right. brain, the brain injuries, uh, maybe in, they didn't have – I mean, this is just me spitballing. Maybe they yeah. didn't know the exact facts. Like I know this case was taking place in Connecticut, so that doesn't look good on you trying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just because right. of where it's happening, it's not really the best yeah. idea to have a court case there. Though, unfortunately, that happens. Now, brain injuries happened with a lot of wrestlers, but do you think someday that the WWE will realize? Oh, wait, you know, you CTE, brain injuries. Like, there's a lot more happening that we're aware of that maybe we could have. Because you're saying you don't work, you don't get paid. Is there right. anyone forcing you to work when you're injured, or are you like, hey, my arm really hurts, but I got to get paid? I, uh, you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of a a, a fine line there. Mm. Um, you know, you know that you got to work to get paid. But at the same time, you know, they want you to be out there working too and that stuff, you know. It's a it's a, it's a catch-22. It's a very tough thing. It's a hard question to answer. It really is. Well, at the same time, you know, it, you don't want to be having brain issues as you're discussing right now. In today's world, you're saying some moments are embarrassing to you because of these injuries. And you said you didn't have a contract. And I, I think maybe that's the only issue in these court cases where they can just look. They, it, it, you might be right, completely right. But it's like, oh well, you didn't technically work for us, so and that and that's on the unfortunate nature of this probably lawsuit with a lot of wrestlers I've talked to who were involved with this. I have kind of the same issue, like, well, you help all these other people, why can't you help me a little bit? And and it may, I I don't know, like the fine line of being forced to work but wanting to get paid, obviously that's food on your table for your family for you, for you. Right, right. And the thing is, too, you know, you didn't want to miss you didn't want to miss working because. You know, if you miss too much, too much on that stuff, you know, because of something like that, you know, they can say, hey, you know, we're, we don't we don't need you anymore. Boom, you're done. You're out of a job. You know, we'll just get somebody else out there. Right. You know, it's, it's very tough. It's very tough. Now, I wonder if that's the carrot in front of the horse type situation where that's how they got a lot of people to keep on working while injured to say, well, you know, that's a great warlord. But, you know, I got a muscly guy over here, too. Like maybe uh, you should go out there and work and stop being a little, little baby. It's like, oh, I have a concussion. Like, hello. You know, yeah, yeah, it was it was like that, and that's like I say, you know, if if you can't perform, you can't do it. We'll just find somebody's got more oil than you, and we'll put them out there and let them go. Now, you know, did someone 
Did someone actually say these things to you or no? No, no, they never said that. But it was, you, it, you, but it was perceptive know, that way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Perception. It's like, oh, you can sure you can have the day off. Sure, but re- that sure is saying oh, like it'll, it'll, it's something it'll underneath it. It'll get back to Vince quick. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, world, it's a baby. He's hard to work with because <laughs> he wants to go to, you know, take a day off to relax his two broken yep. legs. Yep. When I actually first started to WWF, it was three W's and an F owned by Vince Sr. and oh, Jr. Oh, yeah. So there is my first taste of the WWF. The second stint was WWF in 88, 87, towards the end of the year, finishing up in Memphis for Jerry Jerry. But get it, let's get back to the plethora of the talent and the great talent in my first locker room I walk into. Of course, it's a big room with the... You know, the steel curtain, they have uh, curtains. They, they do them at rock and roll. They, they use them oh, yeah. for everything. And behind stage stuff, like in country music and whatnot. But I open that curtain up. And, of course, I was taught by the great Malenko, you shake everybody's hand, even if you're nervous and scared. <laughs> I'm 21 years old, Steve. <laughs> and I'm, I'm meeting Bob Orton Jr., Black Jack Mulligan, uh, Bob Backlund, Jesse Ventura, Vince Jr., Vince Sr., Strongbow, Gorilla Monsoon, uh, uh, Adrian Adonis. Uh, Again, uh, I think I said Jesse Ventura. Yeah. uh, Mr. Fuji, uh, Saito. I mean, there's more, and I don't mean to miss them, but there's got to be 50 guys back there for TV. For TV. And they do TV back in the day. Every three weeks, Allentown would be first. Second, would be Hamburg, PA, the field house. Yeah. And that was every three weeks. And those TVs would run. I think they'd start them at seven or eight. They wouldn't end till maybe after 11. And then back in those days, in two days of TV, I probably worked six times. Compared to WWF, I'd work one TV. That's it. Like if we had 20 matches, I'm on one of them, you know, at Raw mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, for the uh, or uh, superstars or challenge or taping or whatnot. So what's the difference in pay then if you're working one match but you're still there all day versus working six matches which are there all day as well? None. <laughs> no difference. Now, well, the six now back in the day those six matches I was get I was getting compensated well, and it's part of paying dues, Steve. You're not you're not doing things for free, and it's nothing like that. Um, and then of course when it was the WWF, once in a while I would do two. Or something gimmicky, but most of the, for the most part, and the rest of my career, WCW, uh, Impact, as of a uh, couple of months ago, uh, one time, mm-hmm. one time is the usual because they got a they got a host of, of people. They don't you it's overkill, and you want to get everybody in there. So if you because if you start using guys two or three times in one TV, it looks lack of luster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Payback 2013, it seemed like you were destined to win the Intercontinental Championship and a triple threat yeah. match, and you got Damn. a concussion. And the person who replaced you, Curtis Axel, Michael McGillicuddy, Joe Heading, a hodgepodge of names, he ended up replacing you and then won the Intercontinental title. To me, it was like so Can't obvious you, you were about to win the Intercontinental title. It was yeah. so obvious you were about yeah. to win the belt. And then suddenly, you got concussed, and then I feel like from that point on, it was like you were never, you you weren't going up anymore. You weren't going sideways. You were slowly going down. Is that how you feel? Um, man, I got a lot of tattoos that summer. Um, you know, I I don't want to call anybody out, but I was working somebody, man. He knocked me out, and um, I knew they were going to put the title on me, and I didn't tell the office that I got knocked out. And I kept working with a concussion. And at that time, it was kind of the beginning of um, like the really they were really diving into the CTE 
um, having Chris Nowinski come to a lot of uh, TV tapings and uh, just, you know, the protocol was if you get your bell wrong, um, make sure someone knows and you know, to, there's, there's a protocol where you have to do a uh, impact test to come back. Start, hey, come on, bro, I'm doing an interview. Um, but I, I was, you know, I kind of grew up on the Indies where if you get your bell wrong, especially if they're putting the Intercontinental title on you, maybe just don't say anything. And uh, so I actually kept working. And then I um, co coincidentally was working Cardona in Long Island and got knocked out just on a bump. And uh, I didn't know where I was at. And um, so I think they were upset with me that I didn't tell them. Like I kind of, I think they thought that I was lying to them, but um i don't know what you know what, what are you gonna do so of course but that's uh, not like people have done that before like for instance the first thing i think of is when brian danielson daniel bryan he had was having seizures and he had multiple concussions and he never told anyone about these things and then when he was getting signed to the wwe nigel mcginnis told them he was having the same issues so they didn't sign him they signed him to yeah. Brian, even though he was having the same exact problems you're describing kind of with yourself you know a yeah. concussion you weren't telling anybody but yet you were going to keep going, but then eventually one, one thing caused a domino effect, it seems. And, and that one concussion yeah. is what did that for you. It feels like, and again, I remember clear as day. I was like, Oh, he's going to totally win. I love it. Oh, he's hurt. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what, in, in retrospect, maybe I won the IC title and I was all loopy and then maybe my brain would have been a lot worse, you know, right. like, right. do you, you know, um, the goal is to live into your, to your well into your seventies and eighties uh, to be able to function, and mm -hmm. um, and that's what the WWE was looking out for me. They were looking out for me. They didn't want me to fucking be damaged goods, and um, I can un I totally understand where they're coming from, uh, but I, I feel like they thought I was lying to them, and um, you know, so it is what it is. Of course. You know, it's no one's fault except for that person who obviously. Yeah. That concussion. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I had, I was in a car accident last year and I got hit hard. My whole car was completely total. People thought I was dead in my car. And I tried to be like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And I totally had a concussion. I, I went yeah. to work like the next day and I was like, I'm fine. And I was like, oh, those bright lights are killing me. Like, it was yeah, like yeah. all the signs were there, but again, I was trying to play it off. And obviously, when you're in the bubble, you're like yeah. yourself, you want to please these, the, the, the masters and the bosses and the managers yeah. and see how great you are. And, and, and you, I assume you're talking about how you grew up in the, you know, the age of work through pain. Yeah, yeah. So were you working um, through pain? Well, I mean, I, I think when I started in, the, in 99 and I mean, you, people didn't know a lot about concussions and um, I, I, st I mean, obviously they still don't till this day. I mean, you only can really do a lot of research on the brain post um, death. So um, CT is a fairly new thing, you know, and back then if you got your bell rung and sat on the on the bench you're kind of considered a pussy so that was just the wild west back then and you know going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the the interview of some of those old timers that are dealing with those effects of the 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 wild west of yeah. wrestling back in the day you know it's just it's just a lack of education and um you know the brains it's a it's a it's a very dangerous and scary and delicate thing to to mess with so um wwe did a really good job and they are doing a really good job of uh, um you know having protocols set in and testing mm -hmm. um i just feel like vince was he he was he had a vision for me and he was excited and then when that happened i think he kind of it kind of pissed him off a little bit you know so um but um but my my uh my health and well-being is i need i need my brain to dig holes here up in maine while i'm building houses so But it turns out, you know, you eventually did leave the WWE after WrestleMania yeah. 8. And 
I, the story is, and I want to make sure this is clear. The story is Pat Patterson was leaving, and you wanted to be put in the position of creative. You wanted to be involved backstage yeah. more than been in the ring. Were there promises given to you that were not kept? Yes, absolutely. Vince had promised me that position uh, long before, you know, several years before, that that would be my spot. And uh, so when it happened, I'm like, okay, I'm ready, man. And uh, the story was, well, out of respect for Pat, we're not going to fill that position. Bullshit. Pat never left. <laughs> he was still there. He right. just wasn't shown on TV. Interesting, because, you know, there's a lot of stories that involve Pat Patterson over the years, even Vince yeah. McMahon, where there's controversy surrounding their names. And I think for TV reasons, let's pretend he's not on TV, so he doesn't actually work here. Right. But, but you're being told one story, but yet on the audience is being told another. Yeah. It, it's very daunting to think that someone like you of your stature, even at the time, even today, the world is promised something and this promise is not kept. Is that a common thing you think in wrestling where promises are given and then they're just oh, ripped God, away? Yeah. God, yeah. Yeah, they dangle that carrot out in front of you a lot. Why do you think that is? To get you to do what they want because you to do? They can, because they can. You know, and uh, I don't need any bullshit, you know. Just keep your word with me. I'll do everything I can, man, and then some. Right. You know, I'll deliver. I will right. deliver, you know, and I always yeah. have. So for him not to deliver on that one, it was huge with me. You know, it was bad enough that I got screwed over the Hogan thing. I couldn't wrestle Hogan because the crowd was split. Not my fault they don't like Hogan. <laughs> you know, it's not my fault they're cheering for me. You know, let's get it out there and go. Help. The grueling schedule that you're dealing with, what was your actual schedule? Sometimes we'd go two weeks or three weeks straight and then go home for two or three days. You know, oftentimes there was runs that were definitely two weeks long. Uh, we'd, do, we'd do a loop somewhere, like we'd fly into Newark, New Jersey and do the New York cities and then a couple of, you know, like Philadelphia and Scranton and all those and come back around to Newark again, fly out and not go home go to another centralized city and do a loop there, get the rental cars and drive around there and do a bunch of house shows. And then sometimes they would plant three days of TV in the middle of there somewhere. So we really wouldn't go home. And then finally we'd get to go home for two days or three days, just long enough to get your laundry done and maybe take a nap. <laughs> That's what I would say. Of course, not me. I'd go home and keep partying because I wasn't married and I didn't have kids. So I was living the rock star life on the road and at home, unfortunately. I was going to ask you that because I've not talked to many wrestlers of coming home and being like, you're want to hang out with your kids or your wife. And then you are on the couch and you're like half yeah. asleep. And they're like, oh, daddy, throw the ball with me and I'll play dolls. And you're like, I can't even move like I'm yeah. my body. And, you know, you're at a different situation altogether. So I guess, you know, positive <laughs> coming home and I having to deal with someone poking you in the face going, play with me, daddy. But at the same time, you're a lot wild. of wrestlers have it's suffered. Still brutal. Yeah. And uh, so you told them you wanted to go home and they said, well, then go home. And so what does that mean? They fired you? Yeah, they they sent me home in the middle of a contract. I and basically what was happening is. When I re-signed the one-year deal and got that feud with Triple H, that's why they gave it to me, to keep me and re-sign me for the extra year rollover. But as soon as I signed it, they did the deal. We did the deal with Triple H, and they immediately had him do a 20-second job to the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 12 and, and, and also immediately put him with Mark Marrow. And I just went back to losing to all the new heels that came in. Mm -hmm. The only difference now is I had shorter hair and I was still a baby face. And uh, so I was getting frustrated and, you know, periodically I'd have these little powwow sessions with me and Vince McMahon and Jerry Briscoe standing out in a hallway somewhere. And I would express my disgust, you know, with how they, they were using me. And I remember one, a couple of times I said, if you're not going to use me any better, this is the shit I said to Vince McMahon. 
I said, if you're going to use me any better than this, just send me home. And I remember he would always be like, he would pause for a second. Like he couldn't believe I said that shit to him. And, and believe me, I was not in the right frame of mind. At that point, I was using drugs. I was injured. My back was hurt. I started doing tons of painkillers. And like I said, I was always the first guy at the bar. And I was just erratic in my behavior. And I was really frustrated. And I felt like I was ready to just leave. And And then one day, he just... Actually, what he said first was he was going to send me to Memphis to develop as a heel. And he was going to pay me $1,000 a week. Which the hilarious thing is, that was a lot more money than they were paying me at the time. Because they had me off the road most of the time. And I wasn't really booked. And uh, But I think... I. Uh, my response is what got me sent home. I said, I'm going to need that in writing. And it looked like Vince bit a turd. <laughs> he just kind of looked at me like, absolutely. But then like a week later, Jerry, Jerry Briscoe's walking up to me in the locker room saying, nah, Vince said you can go on home. And I just remember going, it's over. Wow. I can't believe it. Yeah. So that's how it, it kind of went down in a nutshell. But are you still under contract when they send you home? Or they like this? They sent me home. I just signed that year. So I think I had like eight, six or eight months left on that contract. A contract of nothing. I mean, it's like. Oh, the guaranteed of you have to work for us. Basically, it was you were an independent contractor. And all all they guaranteed you each year was 10 matches at $150 each. And I had already reached that. I I had gotten past the $1,500 mark uh, at that point. But. Yeah, so they sent me home, and I basically couldn't work for anybody else until the contract was up, and it didn't matter anyway, man. I went home to a shitstorm of, you know, drugs and alcohol anyway, and just drowned myself in that, you know, whirlwind of shit and uh, for a while, and uh, yeah, that's how it kind of went down. You know, there was a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics in the wrestling business, but at least when you were on the road, it was a controlled environment. They were pointing you and telling you where do you need to be here at this time. You need to be there at this time. You need to be. Once I went home and I wasn't booked anymore, there wasn't anybody telling me where to be or when. <laughs> it was, it, you know, the, it went off the rails real quick. So, uh, but yeah, that's kind of how it fell apart. Interesting. Now, do you find that when you went home that, a lot of wrestlers have the same situation with you is once they're off the road, well, there is no more road. So there's only the other parts of the road left. And that's, you went home and you were living the rock star life, but in your house. Yeah. And I didn't have any money or anything to show for it. So I was pretty much broke, broke almost immediately. And I had this hefty drug problem. So I had to figure out, you know, ways and means to get money and get drugs and, I started bouncing at strip clubs and shit like that. It was just ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, it was just bad. It was bad for a while, several years. So when you're working at the WWF, you don't have to tell me exact numbers, but, like, are you in – so let's go with 94 to, 90, to, like, 96. What do you – throw out a ballpark number. What is coming in into your wallet? Are you spending it? on the road or are you pocketing some of this and hoping in like not going and buying Lamborghinis? Uh, <laughs> I couldn't afford Lamborghinis if okay. I wanted to, but I was not saving money. Um, you know, I think the first couple of years I barely broke even with the, we paid our own road expenses. And remember we were independent contractors. So yes. we filled out a 1099 at the end of the year and we got to claim, you know, our, rental cars and hotels and food and stuff like that. Any Anything we spent pretty much on the road as expenses, we got to take, you know, right off of our taxes. But still, even that being said, I, I, I really made, made almost no money. Um, wow. Vince knew when he had somebody that he could starve. And he knew, you know, um, like I said, I was a mark walking in the door. Well, he saw me 10 miles away coming. And I think that influenced how he paid me in those first couple of years. But plus, I think they're going to test you for the first two or three years anyway, and they're going to kind of starve, you know, starve you and see 
how your attitude is and and you know make you work for it and you know unfortunately i think some of those tests i failed in the end but uh it, it wasn't times were lean then anyway money was way down for most everybody like i said there was the haves and the have nots and uh i definitely wasn't on the big money list <laughs> you know there's a lot of us workhorses on the undercard that would uh you know on a nightly basis kill ourselves for scraps basically wow most likely because they're thinking you know hey he's a wrestling fan he's in the wwf the number one company in the world he's gonna be there but obviously eventually like a lot of wrestlers they get cut and once they get cut that lifestyle that they were living is still intact but the wrestling world is no longer there unfortunately for a lot of people so yeah july 13th 1996 was your last match in the wwf you took on tl hopper garbage man versus toilet man so uh you know i I gotta say i've always enjoyed both characters but obviously yours a lot more than the sounds of a toilet flushing was his music toilet it was symbolic of my career at the time Uh, i remember he i was such a beaten professionally I was such a beaten person I was beaten down and I was just sick of it and ready to go and I remember uh Tony Anthony T.L. Hopper came up to me before our match and he, of course I was doing a job for him and he goes would it be okay if I stuck the plunger in your mouth and now I don't know how many guys would have agreed to that but I just at that point I just remember going what the hell else could they do to me at this point just go ahead man i was just like you know why not you know add insult to injury why not and uh that's kind of how i went out yeah in my mouth wow